Thank you very much. Um, we've heard in threat modeling sort of some of the problems on the panel yesterday. Jonathan was kind enough to show us some methodology. Um, we've seen how it fits into a wider software, you know, secure development lifecycle from uh, ESAR yesterday. Now I want to talk about how I've built programs and what's been successful and what's not. Um, at least for me, and some of this may be stylistic, again, um, as Adam was so articulate to say, there are, there are threat modeling methodologies. There are threat modeling processes, implying that there's a lot of different ones. So none of this is truth with a capital T. It's uh, all from experience. So, you know, threat modeling. We are talking about threat modeling, not transcendental meditation, just so we're clear here, right? <laughs> Um, and I'm not going to teach you how to fly. Um, if anybody's old enough to remember, there was a university in Iowa, Iowa run by the Transcendental Meditation people, and they swore they were going to teach you how to fly. So I'm not. Um, but maybe, just maybe, there is some wizardry here. And I'm going to try and unplug some of that. It's actually the fact that people who do this a lot get really used to doing the mental math and making the mental um, wires and connections really fast. And also, they usually have some way of assessing risk, which maybe they can articulate or maybe not. But really, it's not so much wizardry as it is experience and study. And after you've seen a whole lot of systems certain things begin to look very much the same. And so you begin to have the patterns of threat modeling of the typical attacks and the typical types of defenses that you can implement for those attacks kind of in your gut. And that's what really it is. It's not really wizardry. So let's unpack. Um, first of all, I'll tell you, I've been around for a while. Um, I've done thousands of, of threat modeling, security assessments of lots of systems all the way from stuff underneath the operating system, little funks of, of memory, trying to watch memory faults or whatever, all the way to huge global clouds. So I have a, I have a pretty wide bit of experience and I have literally taught hundreds of security architects, not only how to threat model, but how to be security architects in the four programs I've built. Which means, obviously, Dinosaur. So let's, you know, you don't necessarily have to pay attention to what I'm, what I'm going to say here, but, but this comes from these many experiences, and that's what I'm, I'm going to try and deliver to you. Um, we're not going to dig into threat modeling, but if you want to dig into the, to the way I do it, um, we can talk offline. I want to talk about programs here because that fills in the curriculum around threat modeling, and I so appreciate the fact that uh, OWASP, wanted to focus so much energy on threat modeling. So this is my working definition, and it actually came, apart, came about because despite the fact that there are 440 pages in my threat modeling book, I don't think I actually defined it in a simple paragraph anywhere, which is, you know, shame on me. Um, and as I was teaching classes around Intel and running around the world teaching threat modeling, a the couple of the first ones, they said, well, wh wh where's the definition? Good engineers, right? And so that forced me to come up with something. So I want to highlight a little bit here just to, just to really understand what it is we're talking about. We're doing an analysis to attempt to uncover the likely attacks, not all the attacks, because unless you have $60 billion black budgets, you're not going to be able to fix everything or remediate everything. You want to get at the stuff that's important, right? That's a big part of this. And you want to bring that system not to your sense of perfection, but to what the organization needs for that system. So that's why I say to a known, so it will resist attack and to a known defensive state and hopefully provable like with penetration testing and, and, and other kinds of security testing. So you want to be able to prove the state. Hard engineering there. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a little tour here just for a moment. Why is this important? Why is it important that we threat model? 
because it's been more than 20 years since NIST 814, yes, 14, what are we at now, 853C or D B or something? Anyway, 14, and they said do early security requirements, and most companies don't do this, or they do it spotty. They have some people who can do it. We're really far behind in design. It's a problem. Um, I would say it's one of the major problems in our industry. We've been very focused on implementation errors. We call them vulnerabilities. Um, but we have really s kind of failed as an industry, in my opinion, to address the design issues. Why? Because it's hard, and there are not that many people who are good at design. You know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and, you know, is it because developers don't care? Is it because they're dumb? Not really. It's just that there are a lot of competing stuff, as we heard from, uh, wasn't that in your talk, Isar, yesterday, where you talked about how how developers have a lot of competing. Yeah, that was you. Um, and, and that's really what it is. Okay, so l let's consider some big design misses. And I'll, I'll get to Spectre and Meltdown in a minute. They're not up here, <laughs> but I will. I like current events. Um, let's, let's consider a couple of things very quickly. Everybody, and who, who has not heard about, about Chris Valasek and Charlie Miller's Jeep Wrangler hack? Who has not heard about it? Okay, very quickly, um, the, I'm not going to go into the tech details, but a very sensitive system did not have all the controls in it that were necessary from the entertainment system, which connected outbound to uh, the cell system, and they put up a micro cell and were able to, like, put on and take off the brakes and, and uh, steer the car and... It scared the reporter in the car out of his mind. He said, can we go to a parking lot? Because uh, I'm on the freeway. This is dangerous. It's true. Um, so, you know, is that, is that an implementation error? All the MISRA, if you know what MISRA is, um, code checking in the world would not prevent that. It's a design problem. That's why I'm focusing on design here. That's what threat modeling is all about, is design. Um, and you see that when we think about target, yeah, people know about the target breach, right? It was a few years ago, but been some other ones. Um, people have been focusing a lot on the actual exploit that got them into the heating and cooling vendor. But that isn't the design problem, or it might have been. I don't even know what it was. It, it isn't important. There's a huge design problem. Why, the reason I include that there is because we tend to think about software or discrete applications, and systems need secure design too. Their systems allowed access to the payment terminals from the heating and cooling vendor. Is that, a, is that an implementation error or is that a design error? I would argue it's a design error. You don't design your networks that way. Your, your payment terminals shouldn't be there. And besides, you shouldn't have one VPN policy for everybody. The cooling, heating and cooling folks only need the thermostat, right? They don't need anything else. If that had been true, there would have been no breach. If they had just had the right kind of policies, that's a design problem and their systems failed. Um, so we have this design problem, and it crops up again and again and again with these kinds of issues, and here's what we have been doing. I know because I've led groups that did this. You parachute into the project. How many people are security people that do um, threat modeling or security assessments or whatever? You parachute into a development team, right? They are immediately, they're all speaking in their acronym speak, and they have, you, they, you have no idea what they're talking about. You try to find all the different stuff that's, that, that needs to be fixed. You hand them their requirements, or you say their flaws, or whatever, however you term it in your world. And then you, you, you come out, and then when the system goes live, you do a check to say, did you, fix, did you do all the requirements? How many people live a life like that in this room? Because that's the way it's done in a lot of places. You see, I got a few hands here. Maybe the other people aren't willing to, to admit. Well, that's the, that's the old guard. How well is it working for you? How many, times, how many times do you get called in to do this security assessment three days before the go live? <laughs> Who's had that experience more than once? Yeah, look at the hands going up in this room, right? Okay, old guard. Is there a way to do this? Is there a way to get around that problem? That is the essential problem that I want to address today. 
Is there a way? Because what that leads to is bulky defensive development teams. It leads to resistant project managers and, a he and lots of escalations and exceptions. And there's huge amounts of friction between security and development. Can we get rid of that? I say we can. Just stick with me. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Just stick with me. Um, can I get a witness? Uh, but seriously, um, this is, yeah, <laughs> the security becomes synonymous with no. And we, a lot of us are survivors of that. It's no fun. And you get these really defensive security departments, you know, and, and they're all they're turning inward, a lot of foxhole humor. That's not good. So um, can you be different? The answer, I started thinking about this actually in 2002. So I've been, I've been making mistakes since 2002 at this game, I'll just tell you. Um, and and that's, why, that's what I'm giving you today. I started thinking, well, well, how can we do this? And the essential problem that I started with was we couldn't hire any security people. That took a year and a half to hire me. And I was one of the few, in those days, I was one of the few people with a lot of software design background. Not so much security. I learned very quickly I knew nothing about security when I got with the, with the real security people at Cisco. I had thought I was pretty good, but um, they uh, disabused me of, of any uh, um, fantasies I might have about my, my abilities in security. Nevertheless, um, I began to think about this problem with my friend Michelle Koblis. And we realized we were never going to hire people. So what could we do? And that's where we started thinking about satellites. And I know like in the BSIM, if you, if you talk to the Synopsys folks, they have the whole thing um, about satellite security people and how you do that. And they've written a lot about it. So go, go check that out. I'm not going to talk about it too much here. But we started thinking about that sort of a co-independent thing. And we realized that we were going to have to play a very long game and we were going to have to train as opposed to hire. And that kind of put my feet on this path. Now, um, what I've learned now is you teach, you mentor, you support, and then you let go. That's a very big part of this. So people can really go. The one thing about the way I do this, and I've done it four times now, mistakes will be made. So your management has to be ready for that. And you try to keep the really bad stuff from going forward but mistakes are going to be made. And so that's the first thing I ask if I'm going to do a new team is, you know, how, how, how tolerant are you of mistakes? Because I don't really want to train a whole new team and build up like right my last position. I had 110 security architects that I was working with as their technical lead. Um, I don't want to put all that much energy to 110 people if mistakes can't be made. So, you know, that's one thing you got to understand about this long, long process. Um, and it takes a long time. Okay. Um, what you want to do is get threat modeling to become part of the woodwork so that security aren't doing it all the time. That's my goal, is to help people grab a hold of it and own it. I, I think if those of you who were here yesterday listened to Adam, he put it so, so wonderfully articulately um, that uh, th the idea is to, is to get not us, the great security people, to do it, but to have teams own it. And really, it becomes part of the woodwork because it's fun. It's fun to attack a system mentally. I mean, it's fun to attack a system not mentally. KMAP and, and Allison um, uh, here, um, that's what they do for a living, but, uh, and I'm sure there are other hackers here, but, uh, but I happen to know them, so I'll call you out here. Um, but. Uh, it's fun, but it's, it's fun to do this mentally and, 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 and think through these things. And so people can have, you know, they can buy into it. So um, the other thing, and I, and I think Adam made this point yesterday too, um, is that it's a team sport. Um, Owen Carroll, who's my peer and my friend, um, started putting up threat models in the daily stand-up for his agile teams. And he noticed that when everybody had access to the threat model, they, when it's to take something off the, off the backlog, they'd immediately look at it and go, I wonder what security implications this have, because there's the threat model right there. It's very, very powerful to include everyone. So then, uh, based on that, I started running around the world when I did threat modeling training and saying, everybody comes. The product manager, the project manager, 
dev manager, everybody. Everybody comes into the room. Now, some of these people don't necessarily want to play the game, but just listening opens up the process really powerfully. Um, and so, and, and the other side of that is people have different pieces of the puzzle around how the thing works, around who will attack it, around the risk posture of the, the potential risk posture of the system. There are a whole bunch of stakeholders. So if you include people, you can get all of that. Security shouldn't, in my opinion, be making those decisions. That's not our position. So it's a crossroads of knowledge, a threat model. And when you include people, when you're very inclusive, you get that crossroads, you get that diversity, you get all of those different perspectives, and it makes the work better, much better. So, you know, make it inclusive. When I used to do it, the way I used to do it was I went in and I got the lead architect and we sat and we built the threat model. And then it was communicated outwards to everybody else. I've dropped that completely. Like I say, I open it up to everyone. We do the threat model. Some people are very, very silent, but they walk out and they understand that people will be attacking their systems. And that's the first key, it turns out, to getting them to take security seriously and prioritize it. Okay, so um, as I said yesterday, iteration is your friend, not your foe. Let, pe let your threat model breathe and grow just like you do every other part if you're doing agile uh, just like you're letting the software grow the design grow let the threat model grow you have to re come back to it and iterate it um, as things change and it'll be fine believe me i've got an entire i've got 4000 developers today and 110 security architects they uh, they're almost every team is agile and every team threat models. I haven't found a team that wasn't threat modeling for a couple of years because of this, this approach. All right, um, let's talk about Meltdown and Spectre. Shall we? Just, just take a little tour here. Um, I was involved fairly early on on this um, as it began to break because uh, McAfee wanted potentially to respond. And I believe we were the first security company to make an analysis and I wrote the first draft of that so you can go out and read in security matters and read our draft from our team um, so who would say these are vulnerabilities Spectre and Meltdown nobody how about design flaws that was the big headline design flaw who thinks in this room that Intel was hiding this for years my don't we think badly of people hmm um, okay let's take a look at what it really is did I huh that shouldn't be there where's my where's my meltdown slides Ack. this is not this is not this is not working these are not supposed to be those slides that's okay I can do this I can do this without those slides but I wonder where my slides are I had some really cute pictures Ah, here we go. I'll have to go back for those other ones. Consider the Bronze Age. Anybody a history fan? Consider the Bronze Age. For about 2,000 years, bronze was king. It's a great design. You built a sword out of bronze. It was great. It, you know, it, you get out there, you do your warring, you, uh, you know, rape and pillage, you do your whatever it is, and... and uh, you conquer your foes, and it was all good, right? 2,000 years, that's a heck of a long time for design, especially in web years. Um, but then came along some research. And the research was in metallurgy in this case, and they figured out how to make a harder iron. What happened to the bronze? I mean, the changeover was really fast. Why? Because the guys who went out there with the bronze their swords were cracked in half instantly by the ones with the, with the iron, right? Well, iron lasted for a while, about 800 years, until it was uh, replaced with uh, mm, gunpowder. <laughs> you know, these, this is the work of designs. Designs, getting 2,000 years out of a design is great. But in our world, um, in our world, coming back to threat modeling, 
My crystal ball ain't that good. It really isn't. Um, I can't tell what research is going to come along. Think about it. The speculative execution and the way caches were used are used in a CPU, and uh, not only Intel CPUs, let's remember that. Um, that was a pretty good design. It lasted for about 15 years. Not bad in web years. That's a long time. The threat landscape of 2002, 2005, radically different. The tooling. Did anybody go to Jay Haddock's talk yesterday afternoon and look at how many tools? I used to have to do that stuff with Nmap laboriously and aux scripts in order to pull out the stuff I wanted. It was really long and hard. Um, and now you have all these tools. The tooling's gotten radically better. Heck, we didn't even have Python in those days. You know, we used a, we used a bronze axe to write our code. You chipped it into stone, and then you ran it in the computer. Um, but seriously, my crystal ball isn't that good. What can we design? What can we look at when we're doing a design? Can we see that far in the future? I would argue no. So um, you do what you can with what you know are active today, and then you imagine how those may change in the future. But there are always unforeseen changes in design. Are we going to call those a flaw? You know, had you been designing that CPU, do you think you would have been able to tell that that uh, based on about six years of research, a couple of teams would figure out a way to get into the caches? I certainly wouldn't. But then I don't design CPUs, so I'm kind of the wrong person. But nevertheless, I don't think my crystal ball is that good. And I don't think that's, I, I don't think I can do that. So let's be careful when we throw around the word flaw and when we start thinking badly of, of companies. I'm not, I'm not standing up for Intel. They have all their problems. I'm glad to be out of there. But, um, you know, that's, that's a different story. I'll talk to you offline. That's neither here nor there. That's not the point. The point is they weren't hiding anything. The system works as designed. Great research. My one as a threat modeler, and this brings it right back to the topic on hand here, as a threat modeler, if I start seeing new research, I do believe that's my job. The first publish about evading Kasler in the kernel was um, 2015, I believe. As a threat modeler, I should be on top of that research and starting to think, where is this going to lead with my CPUs? That we can fault Intel or AMD or whomever for because the research is all out there. You can read the papers. This is a long body of research that's been coming for like three, four years and, and is based on a couple of years of research before that. You can read the research. The papers are published. You just go download them. Um, and, and I did <laughs> when this came, when this started to break, right? Uh, and the point is that as threat modelers, that's our job and that's where iteration helps us. Coming back to topic here. I told you I was going to deal with. Th so, you know, cyclical evaluation, very important. Reevaluation. Okay. So, um, finally, one other thing um, before we move along here. How am I doing for time? Okay. Um, as, I, as, as we talk about it, one of the hardest problems in threat modeling is prioritizing. Who's got unlimited money to uh, fix every single thing you can find and imagine in your software? Who has that? Who has a $60 billion black budget? Anybody from the NSA? <laughs> okay. So, apparently no one. I've never had that luxury. So, I have to figure out what's likely, what needs to be fixed now, what needs, what can wait and why and how long. That's the essential problem. That is the hardest problem, I think, in threat modeling. It's easy to come up with attacks. It actually is. Once you start getting your mind in it and once you start understanding how attacks go, that's the fun part. I keep saying that, but it is. Do you have fun? Ro uh, Robert, do you have fun when you do that, that part of the... And do your students have fun? Yeah, see? Robert and I know each other. Um, I happen to know he's a brilliant threat modeler, so, you know. 
I can point fingers at Robert and he can, he can say, don't embarrass me. Um, but seriously, um, that's the fun part. The hard part is figuring out once you got this long list, what's going to go above the line, what can wait, and what's going to go below the line and I'll never do it. So risk. And um, in order to do that, it's not my risk. I might be very risk aversive in some things. You know, that's not the point. Um, when I do a threat modeling class, I have everybody ohm for a little while while they think about what their risk tolerance is. You, you're laughing, but I actually put up a slide that says that. No, I don't make people breathe. Um, but I do have them th consider because that's not the point. The point is your company's or your organization's risk posture and that system's risk posture. That's what you're trying to work with, right? You don't care. You got to get yourself out of the way. Um, and so that's the hard part. And um, I want to point out that there's some really good risk stuff out there. I'm not going to go into it. You can talk to me later about it. Um, factor analysis of information risk is an open group standard. It is fabulous. It probably is a little heavyweight for, for doing 15 or 20 different prioritizations quickly with a team. Um, so uh, Vinay Bansal and I invented just good enough risk rating. Uh, I'm not selling it. I don't get any money for it. It's up on my website. It's free. Sans was going to publish it anyway, and then they killed that series. Um, so I just took that that um, document and threw it up on my website with their permission. Um, but uh, the point is, there are some you know there are some methodologies that can help you out with this. Just go and get something repeatable and qualitative, or can be qualitative and consistent. CVSS is not a risk rating. It's a vulnerability severity rating. Don't mistake the two. How many people s programs do you use CVSS as the, as the risk rating and report up? Yeah. Um, go look. Um, I, I wrote a blog about this a, a couple of weeks ago um, on Security Matters um, about a, a vulnerability where uh, CVSS, if you do it right, is completely biased and incorrect. Just to show, now I'm not saying it's not a useful tool. Don't get me wrong. I'm not dissing CVSS, but it's good for what it does. It is not risk. So don't use it for that because um, it won't get you there. And um, don't sweat the small stuff. One of my tricks, one of my really big tricks is I build a lot of trust with decision makers by calling out small risks and just saying to decision makers, you know, there's this stuff. You know, don't spend a lot of time on this. We believe it's a small risk. It's a medium risk. You know, we'll fix it in the next cycle, whatever. And I call all this stuff out. Why? Because I discovered years ago that over time, when they see that you're not always calling that the sky is falling, you're not always saying that, but you actually understand how to calculate risk, when you finally have to say the sky is falling, this is really important, people listen to you because they trust you. Because they've seen a range of risk ratings. So don't, s don't blow your pow power, whatever influence you have, right on that first, you know, I want to get this fixed no matter what. No, nah, no, nah, there's a lot of stuff we can let go. I mean, you need to get it fixed, but maybe not so fast. Okay, so, um, you know, there's nothing perfect. You all know that. I don't have to dwell on this much. Um, and version one can often be just good enough. And finally, um, one of the things that I've seen that really helps people get better at, at threat modeling is to look at a lot of different architectures. So I live in a world where I have a lot of major ar different architectural types. Maybe you only do web programming or, you know, um, I was talking to somebody here yesterday who, you know, they have a web server, but it just goes to a, a local host on, the, on a little box or whatever. Um, that was you. Um, see, I remembered. I was listening. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a different thing, and, and it's fairly constrained. Um, or you might be like we at McAfee where you have global clouds and you have thunks underneath the operating system and you have, you have endpoint software and, you know, it might go on a compromised box or whatever. And so, you know, we have a big broad portfolio of different architectural types. But one of the things that's really powerful is to just get out and look at stuff you're not comfortable with and hang out with arch architects. Because in order to be a good security architect, you all first have to be a good architect. You have to understand what architecture is. That's about structure and it's about abstraction and, and how to do that to get information and to 
obscure other information that's noisy. So that's, that's a big part of the work of an architect. And you can do that by hanging out with architects and hearing what they have to say and learning from them. That's how you know, I got, I've gotten better is just by, by looking at a lot of different architects, uh, hanging out with architects um, and, and looking at them. And the one other thing I will say about that is that um, if you haven't dug yet into the world of enterprise architecture, to my mind, of all the stuff that's been written about architecture, they have the most rigorous engineering methods around in architecture. So it's big stuff. When you talk about enterprise, it's big stuff, right? Um, but at least they, they, they understand the, the practice of architecture. So I've learned a lot by hanging out with enterprise architects, looking at enterprise architectures, and reading enterprise architecture you know, documents and, and, and uh, papers and whatnot as an architect to become a better architect. So get out of your security world and get out there and just go to the team next door if you can. Now, for those of you who parachute or are still parachuting in, you're seeing so many different things potentially. Um, you know, maybe you're, you're getting that education. But get out of your, your own little world. Very, very powerful for training. Um, and uh, let me say that of all the activities in the secure development life cycle, I believe or have experienced that threat modeling is the keystone activity. It may not be the only one, but I haven't seen any other activity because of the fun of playing and attacking the system. It helps people climb into the secure development life cycle completely. So even, you know, I, I have people who are like, you know, junior testers and they'll come in or junior programmers. When they walk out of one of these sessions, they're like, oh, I understand why my security, my piece of security is important now because I've seen that this system can be attacked and these are credible attacks. So it's very, very powerful. That's, think of, if you're doing training, if you're doing mentoring, think of the threat modeling as the keystone activity that can unlock the rest of it and, and get rid of those, those, that friction, that organizational friction between security and, and, um, and development, you know, whether that's IT or product or whatever it is. Um, and, and, and remove that just by doing this activity together. And I like to, like, like when, I'm, when I'm running around McAfee, um, I like to do one of their architectures because then they get something out of it. We don't necessarily have to finish the threat model. We can do that later. But, but I, I, you know, I like to do one of their architectures because something they're familiar with rather than something that's, you know, an example. Um, so, uh, and as to governance, I'll give you a moment to read this little cartoon here. Am I in your way? <coughs> Excuse me. Anybody ever been to one of these architecture review boards? Anybody ever been in front of an architecture review board? <laughs> um, I, I'm not a big fan of them. They have their place. When you got the really big enterprise system and you need the heavy guns to really look at something, a board is a good thing. And that's the right place to use that. But like a scalpel, don't drive. I try not to drive all of my governance through a board because um, you get in this situation where you have people who they didn't read the document beforehand. They have no idea what's going on. Um, so they have to ask you know, basic questions. Um, you, you know, sometimes it can feel at Intel, it often felt like the person who was standing in front of the board was, you know, uh, at their PhD dissertation. And uh, it was very unpleasant. I killed that stuff because, because I don't like that attitude. Um, when I became a distinguished engineer at Intel, I started going, let's, let's have a different feel for this. We're actually trying to help these people, not make them feel bad. Um, but. Um, so learn by doing, I think I talked all of that, active participation. Let's see, I'm looking for a, all right, this is a good one. So, so I do these decentralized programs, thank you very much, do these decentralized programs. They're perfect, right? There's nothing ever wrong with them. <laughs> uh, there is a downside to this kind of decentralized program, and I learned it really hard very early. When we had a central team, we had this beautiful uh, documentation of every project that we'd gone through and their risk profile and a precursor to uh, Jaeger and, and all of this 
documentation. And as soon as we really empowered people to do it, they started keeping their documents wherever was convenient for them. And we lost the center. And we had no idea what was going on and what had been reviewed and what hadn't been reviewed. So you're going to, if you really empower people to pick this up, you have to figure out a different way to capture the center again and keep an eye on your program. You will lose the center. Either that or do command and control if you're not comfortable with that. It's very difficult. And you have to think of other ways to get at the documentation, to make things are sure things are getting done, to have quality control. Um, one of the things we do, and I've done it now in three programs that I've done, is we do peer review. We require for the threat model and other critical activities that are analysis based that one senior person and one person independent of the work review and come to consensus that the work is done. Very lightweight, it's very fast. You don't convene any boards, they can set up their meeting themselves. If they can't come to consensus, they escalate. They bring in another leader. If they can't come to consensus, eventually it comes to my plate. And, um, and either I push it up to escalate it or I, I help them come to a decision or whatever. <coughs> Excuse me, it's nasty cold. Um, but uh, this is very lightweight and it's very fast. And you don't have any boards, you don't have any bottlenecks. It's very easy for people to, if they know all each other and you've built a community of practice, it goes very quickly. And, and you don't have to have everything run through a board. So that's how we deal with that problem. Um, and I've done it a bunch of times, it works great. Um, s but you will lose the center. So you have to figure out some way that all the documentation can be got at. So you know what's going on. Things like, you know, using something like Jira or version one, I'm not selling anything here, um, can help a lot. Uh, if you're all agile. So where was that? Okay. So if I was going to leave you with one little piece here, I'd say we security people have to let go and start training people. We have a design problem. If we don't address that, we will keep having, oh, tens of thousands of, of cameras go out on, onto people's networks that have a default password. That's also a design problem. Um, you know, or what was the last uh, little Lenovo just had a default password thing on their fingerprint scanner? Yeah, I just saw that go by. Um, that's another design problem. We've got to let go. Uh, let me, I think I've got you with all the takeaways here. Um, uh, we had to build because we couldn't hire and that led us down this long path at Cisco for a couple of different groups. And then I've done it uh, at Autodesk, and then I did it, I've done it at McAfee. And I can assure you that the little tips that you'll have in these slides um, do work if you want to go down this path. If you don't, and you're really uncomfortable with empowering other people, don't do it, because it's built on empowerment. Um, and threat modeling, but I will tell you, threat modeling is your keystone activity. It is magic if there's any magic in engineering. And it's culture hacking, little sa shameless self-promotion um, here, some of my books. Um, this is free, avoiding the top 10 security, you know, that's, um, that's uh, uh, Creative Commons license and, and, and all kudos to Gary McGraw for fighting for that. So you can all have that document, you can download it, you can print it, you can have it on your machine. It's free, keep it. Um, unfortunately, my publisher wants to make money on these books. I don't make any money on them. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, some of my books. And if you want a threat modeling library, I told Adam, you know, I always show everybody your book because it's the tome. It is the tome. Uh, mine is kind of a practicum against um, Adam's, you know, methodology and, and approach. And, uh, of course, there's pasta from Tony and, and uh, Marco, which um, really goes into some of the risk-based methods you can use, and it's, it's very good, too. Um, this is almost the entire th threat modeling library, period. Um, there's one other book, The Stride Book, which Frank Swiderski and I had a long conversation, and he would like to forget it at this point. It was from 2002. It was a great start, so um, I'm not against it, but... Um, I don't put it up because it's a bit uh, obsolete now or deprecated. So that's it.
and uh, had a little something about development of central security. Here's some resources, you know. These will all be in the slides. Where to find me, um, blah, blah, blah. Yep, absolutely. Um, could you expand upon why CVSS should not be used for prioritization? Um, because it lacks context. And it lacks um, uh, refinement around um, impact. Notice I didn't say risk and I didn't say loss because impacts can be, if you think about stepping stone exploits, the impact is that I open up the box a little more. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't handle that well, and it's biased. Here's where it's biased, and this is what I wrote about a few, mm, few weeks ago, um, and I used an example of something. Um, it's biased because it treats exposure equal to impact. But the truth is, no matter how exposed something is, if it has no real attacker value or little attacker value, it doesn't matter. And there's no way to factor that in. And so you will come up with scores that are way too high um, because, because it's averaging the access. You know, if you, let's say something's remotely accessible. That builds a very high score. If you have just one high in there on the impact side, say confidentiality or whatever, you've already got a really high score. It's probably going to be close to, close to seven, which starts to putting in my world, that starts putting it up there and uh, better deal with this fast. But that's not necessarily accurate. Because what if, even though you can actually get, you know, hurt integrity or confidentially badly, there's no real attacker value, and let me give you an example of something that has no real attacker value. Um, and, and this is the, if you think about um, double agent, there was one that has um, questionable attacker value, but that's not the one I'm going to use. Anybody know what debugging rights on a Windows machine are? Is that high or low um, privileges? If you have debugging rights on a Windows machine, it's high, right? Right? You pretty much own the box. Why would you need to do a buffer overflow if that's if that if you have to have debugging rights on a on a Windows machine in order to exercise buffer overflow? Researchers do that, pen testers do that, and that's not necessarily wrong. I'm not calling that out as wrong. But as an attacker, I'm having my way with that machine. If I have debugging rights, I'm not sitting around looking for more buffer overflows. I don't need to because I already own the machine. I'm getting persistence. I'm, you know, installing whatever, whatever my goals are, the botnet, the keystroke logger, whatever, right? I'm pivoting to some other machine that's of greater interest, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Um, it's, you see, and that's the part that CVSS doesn't do well with. So here's another example, and we actually, this is, a, this is one from McAfee, and you can go look at McAfee's published security bulletins. There, we're a, we're, a, we're a numbering authority. I've worked with CVSS since before version one, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, Gavin Reed is a friend of mine. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there was a series of issues which, when put together, became a 10. There was a lot of things you could do. You could own a whole machine. So that's that seems really bad. But what if... In order to make that all happen, you have to have slightly artificial conditions by owning the box and quickly doing things um, on it locally when, in fact, you'd have to be working remotely and the timing wouldn't be right because there were a few race conditions would make it difficult. There's no way to account for that in CVSS. So the actual attacker value, the actual reality of it is, and I didn't say we didn't fix it, we did. Um, that's not the point. The point is it was not a 10 not really. And so you have to take that into context. Or you take Spectre and Meltdown, if on our appliances you have to have root in order to install any software on them, who needs Spectre and Meltdown? If you gain root on one of our appliances, man, you own the box. See what I'm saying? 
There, it's the, you have to take in the context and the mitigations that are there. And it gives you, a, CVSS gives you a great swag when something comes in the door. It's fabulous for that. And you should do it. We do it. That's the first thing we do is calculate CVSS and get a, get a swag of whether this is all hands on deck or not. But after that, you've got to do the rest of the analysis in context. Did I answer your question? You do, you do, especially when it's serious. I mean, you know, for ones and fours. And, and, and the other thing is, go look in the CVE database and type cross-site scripting and look at the CVSSs. They go all the way from 1.8 to 9. How is that possible? You know, there's a lot of judgment call in there. All right, next question. All right, so... Um Sorry, I may have hijacked the uh, mic earlier. Um, so what would you, uh, I think every different uh, threat modeling talk that I've been to has at some point prescribed a particular favorite um, risk ranking or risk assessment framework. So what is the framework you would use for assessing which risk assessment framework you would prefer to use in a given environment? That is such a great question. And um, I can only answer, I'm going to try and be short here. Because this is a really long discussion. Um, but I can only say, and it's a fair question, a really fair question. I have seen a lot of BS risk rating systems over the years. And the fact is, I've actually made horrid mistakes. I agreed to one that actually, for years, averaged all the scores together. So, of course, we had a big lump in the middle, and we had no idea what the risk ratings were of anything. And we did that for a couple of years. So I've made massive mistakes in my career. I have made massive mistakes. You know what they say? Experience, wisdom comes from experience, and experience comes from making mistakes. Um, if I have any wisdom, it's because I've made a lot of great mistakes. So, right, this is not an easy question. And I've seen a lot of attempts at getting something in a spreadsheet um, that have been really BS. So I would say your best bet is to get understand risk and how it's calculated. And the best place to go is to go to the open group. I already cited them. FAIR, Factor Analysis of Information Risk. And read Jack Jones's stuff. I happen to be really lucky. I was there when he was developing it just because we were in the same security forum and he kept showing us the work he was doing. And the first four times I went, what are you on, Jack? And then it clicked in my mind. Something powerful happened, and I went, I get it. I get it. And that, that is the best thing I can say, is go look at factor analysis of information risk. That's why the open group made it a standard. I'm not selling anything by Jack. I don't have any interest in his company, Risk Lens, none. Um, I do. He's, he's a friend, so disclaimer. But, and I think the world of his work. But start there, and then go look at the BS that Vinay and I did with Jager, and see if any of that actually helps you get more consistent and repeatable any other questions please One minute. Cool. <coughs> um, every time I hear threat modeling in industry eventually it comes up how do we do this at scale in your crystal ball other than general AI do you see threat modeling at scale yeah I do it at scale yeah yeah that's the point I get 110 well I don't anymore because I just change roles but Harold my successor has 110 security architects doing this on you know many 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 scrum teams on on 180 products so i i've got it at scale and this is the way i've done it um and you know i uh, i will say there are tools i mentioned them yesterday i'm not selling anything i don't have any interest in any of these companies but you could do a lot of baseline stuff i think with tools we don't because it turned out my security architects didn't want to I put the tools in front of them a bunch of times. Said, hey, this is a cool tool. This could save you a lot of time. They wanted to learn how to thread model. What can I say? Um, am I going to argue? I mean, that's not very good leadership in my opinion. So I, I said, I, I'll teach you. I'll do everything I can to make you f effective. They don't want to use tools. They want to do it themselves. But the, there are good tools that can help. Yeah, all right, so that's an interesting problem. Um, and, and one that's uh, really, 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 really interesting. Um, what you want to avoid, what I would like to avoid is the parachute in and come out 
with the hard security requirements because I have seen that that does not work. That just, like I said, that leads to a huge amount of, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll answer this question and then you can grab me and we can talk more. But um, I will say that uh, what you want to do is have s assign people instead of just like round robin, instead have them form relationships with the team and become part of them. Um, if you've only got five people, they should be training five more or ten more. And then the, anybody who sticks, and not everybody does, about half the people I've watched come down the security architecture path don't make it because it's a strange business, um, you know, and, and not everybody sticks, and that's okay. Um, but uh, my, my feeling is that, that you, you have them, if you get people to train, and if people aren't willing to train, I actually don't want them on my team. <laughs> I mean, I know it's hard to hire people, but really... You, you got to be willing to impart your knowledge and empower other people. And when you do that, they will impart their knowledge and empower other people. And you're building your leaders for tomorrow. Because are you going to be in your position forever? You know, I mean, think about it. We do get older. I'm 67, so, you know, I'm getting on. Did I answer your question? Of course, Carl got me beat. Thank you very much. That was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs>